Colossians 3.1 If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Well, now, why should we seek and set our affection on things above? I think he tells you in these verses. He tells you in verse 3, or four, three and 4, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I love the fact that Paul doesn't talk about a future time in which we will be dead and we will be risen. In fact, some religions teach that you have to die a certain way in order to receive glory. But the fundamental grace truth here is that we are dead. Verse 1, we are risen. We are already blessed with all spiritual blessings. We are accepted in the beloved. We are sealed by the Spirit. We are standing in the glory of the holy righteousness of Christ himself. We are living his resurrection life right here, right now, by virtue of the cross of Christ. It's not just that we've been identified with his death, burial, and resurrection, but that our identification with him makes the reality of his resurrection alive in us. Transformed, transforming us into perfect new creatures, dead to sin, alive unto God, living his resurrection life already, and blessed with all spiritual uh, blessings through his unfathomable grace and love. And did you notice that Paul makes a connection here between our identification with his death and resurrection and our motiv motivation as believers? The principle that we should seek those things above and set our affection on things above is bracketed by the truth. That we are already risen. We are already dead. In verse 1 and verse 3. First comes the understanding. The reckoning is true right now. The magnitude of our identification with Christ. And then comes what should be our motivation to seek those things which are above. To set our affections on things above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. The things above are Christ, His glory, our positions, our Father. The things on this earth <laughs> gets less attractive every day, doesn't it? You have all of the, not to mention all of the problems that we're all facing, but you also have all of the, you know, deceptions that were mentioned in the previous chapters of Colossians, you know, the rudiments of the world, the philosophy, the vain deceit. Has there ever been a time where you see more vain deceit than now? You know, you also have the, all of the, the, the way of Cain, the legalism, the ritualism, the ordinances, the worldly ambitions and pleasures. The appeal to, of those things will inevitably fade away when the believer's heart is occupied with Christ who fills that throne with all his glory. This is the true and only way of sanctification. You know, our heart's constant occupation with the risen Christ. The more a believer 
enters into these blessed truths, making them his own by reckoning himself dead, buried, and risen with Christ. The more the things of this earth, the problems of this earth, the politics of this earth, all of that stuff, that nonsense will lose its charm. And Christ above becomes our all, our life, our everything. I thought Paul, you know, here just brilliantly showed that what a Christian needs, it isn't philosophy or anything else, but an ever-increasing realization of his position in Christ, of everything God made him in Christ. Perfect, complete, brand new, behold all things new. The old Jew dead and crucified, literally freed from sin, all that stuff. And then once you reckon, you get that increasing realization of who you are now, what you are, what God has made you. Then you can, we can all be energized by the Spirit through His Word when we seek those things that are above. And when the eyes of the heart seek the risen and glorified Christ and by faith lay hold on our identification with Him, then we're motivated to know Christ evermore, you know, to, to love Christ, to walk like Christ and less like the world. You may notice, too, that God doesn't want your mind partly on things above and partly on things on the earth, but he wants all your mind and all your heart set entirely on Christ. How can we live a life with divided affections? You know, as our Lord himself said, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Divided affections, it's a moral impossibility. Uh, Philippians 3.19, talks, Paul talks about those who mind earthly things, who, that, that their end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Which is totally the state of Christendom today. Carnal, worldly, minding earthly things, filled with lies, filled with the love of the wor uh, world, um, ignorant of scriptures, f just filling, uh, um, filling the heads of believers with whatever it is that they want to hear, like politicians. And they're just totally dead to spiritual matters, spiritual things. Our affections cannot be divided. The distinction between the earthly realm versus the heavenly realm is as stark a contrast as law versus grace. You know, it's as stark a contrast as the devil versus Christ. Defeat versus victory in his grace. If we devote all of our affections on things above, then our affections for things on the earth and toward those who are important in our lives will naturally fall into place. In all the stages of our lives, in all circumstances, we look up to him for his victory, founded upon his immense grace that has us now raised up with a risen Christ. Christ alone and the consciousness of the grace in which we stand in him is enough to raise us above ourselves, above our failures, and above all the deceptions of the world. Verse 3, verse 3 and 4, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. How is it that we are hid with Christ? <laughs> How is it that we're hid with Christ? You know, Christ was visible to the human eyes when he walked on the earth, but now he cannot be seen. Our faith in his death, burial, and resurrection is a payment for all our sins. 
enabled us to be saved, made us members of the body of Christ, all of which cannot be seen. We're spiritually baptized, which cannot be seen. We're spiritually circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, which cannot be seen. We're made new creatures, which cannot be seen. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings, which cannot be seen. We can only accept by faith the evidence of things not seen and walk according to those truths, which means that we will be hid with Christ until we shall appear with him in glory. And you know, hid with Christ also, I think, speaks of our um, eternal security, too. You know, there is no greater security in the entire universe than to be with Christ, than to be in Christ, who sits at the right hand of God the Father. You know, you can't be more secure than that. We often mention that we're sealed by the Spirit, you know, uh, quoting Ephesians 1.13 to prove that we are eternally secure. We'll consider this sentence. We are in God, hid with Christ, and sealed by the Spirit. We are eternally secure in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This uh, verse seems to round out, you know, our eternal security to me within the entire Godhead, which is to be secure beyond all comprehension. And you have in verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I, I love how um, verse 4 contrasts and yet complements verse 3. To be hid with Christ is only temporary, but a day is coming when this life, hidden now, will be fully manifested. When Christ is manifested, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also be manifested with him in glory. I loved how this verse is written. It opens, when Christ who is our life, shall appear, which carries with it all of Paul's total confidence in a sure thing, all of his complete assurance. This event will absolutely happen, and when it does, you will also absolutely be manifested with him in glory. And Paul doesn't say Christ who shows us life or Christ who gives us life. He says, Christ, who is our life? We have an eternal life, an everlasting life, a newness of life. We have the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We have the, the resurrection life of Christ manifest within our bodies. And we have that promise of eternal life which is in Christ. And we have the power of an endless life. The eternal spring of that hidden life we have is the Lord Jesus Christ. And which, of course, all of this reminds me of Romans 6, 4. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Christianity is a life. A permanent newness of life. When we get saved, we enter a new life in which a whole spiritual world we could not see with our eyes is now revealed to us in His Word by His Spirit. We have a new life in the Spirit that's in stark contrast to that old life we had in the flesh. There is also in that expression, I think, the, the permanence of God's life dwelling in us. A life that is always new. A life with an eternal, vigorous energy. A life that never fades or grows old. A life as fresh and new for all eternity as it was the moment we believed. Just as Christ's life and light will never extinguish, so too his life and light inside of us will never, ever extinguish. It's a life that gives us endless joy, endless peace, endless love. 
it said that the soul is where it loves rather than where it lives. Our souls love Christ and we live in Christ because we are one with Christ. And the life of God reigning in our souls becomes the life of our souls forever. And we also have, i got to just make the point, we also have three types of hope in, that ver in verse 4. You have the hope of Christ's appearance, you have the hope of life, and you have the hope of glory with Him. But he doesn't call them out as hopes, as something we hope for or confidently expect. But he states all these things as absolute irrefutable truths upon which we may forever rejoice. You may notice as well that just as he connects our motivations as believers to our identification with the death and resurrection of Christ, so too he links our blessed hope and the manifestation of our future glory with Christ. He links that to our identification with Him as well. You know? What, a, what blessed links these are. You know? Dead with Christ. Risen with Christ. Hid with Christ in God. Forever secure in the Trinity of God. And it's a life now hidden, but will be manifest when Christ, when He comes for the church, and then we shall appear with him in glory. Could we ever be given better reasons to seek those things that are above? Where's your heart? Where's your mind? How upset, worried, anxious are you about all the stuff going on in the world right now? Where are your affections? Where's your hope? Where's the source of the joy in your life? Are you appropriating that? This is the Grace Life Podcast. <laughs> uh, I am your mad, bad brother in Christ. Uh, mad in the sense of mid acts dispensational. Bad in the sense of blessed and delivered. I'm some guy named Joel. I am a lowly associate pastor here at Fellowship Bible Church. Uh, this is, uh, we, uh, we, the, while we're, the, uh, we're watching the world uh, careening down Route 666, we're just keeping our affections on things above, keeping our conversations heavenly, talking about things above, uh, and uh, we've all got our in Christ passports, ready to take a big old flight on flight 777 of Titus 213 Airlines, ready to take off at a moment's notice. I am ready to go. <laughs> uh, we got a bunch of links beneath the video. Check it all out. I give away tons and tons and tons of free stuff. Buy the truth and sell it not. Well, I just got tons of got goodies to give away. I've got uh, links uh, to a book. Uh, all this stuff I was talking about in the opening monologue on identification. There's a great big book on that called Empowered by His Grace, Dead, Buried, Risen with Christ. And understanding everything that, well, not everything, but just getting a basic understanding of what God made you in His Son, which would be the source of all joy, which is cause to understand and celebrate uh, with, with joy all of the hard times that may be coming. Check that book out. You can download it for free. Um, there's uh, links to all kinds of other goodies. I won't get into it. If you're not sure uh, where you are going to spend eternity, you want to know how to get saved, uh, there's a link to David's gospel, David Reed's gospel quiz. Um, check that out. I will give the gospel at the end. We'll probably talk a little bit about it during the podcast, but uh, it has something to do with his death, burial, and resurrection as a payment for all your sins, which all you have to do is trust in him. Uh, put your faith in him believe that he did that for you and then you can have eternal life but i don't want to give it away too soon uh the we've got beneath the, uh, a bunch of other stuff beneath the videos you got to just check it all out there is a link to a page on our website where you could uh financially support the ministry which is uh, uh always always deeply truly sincerely appreciated 
Uh, we could use every uh, help that we can get. If you want to help us keep going and help us to uh, continue to uh, be able to preach and be online and do all this stuff, uh, your support would be greatly, greatly appreciated. You could uh, financially support us through PayPal or the Cash App or uh, send a check or money order to the church. I love you guys. Thank you so much for that. We've got beneath all of that tons of more videos. I got a link to David's video from last night, which was totally epic. Beautiful man. Um, there's a new brand searchlight. And then this new searchlight, uh, which you can also download for free, was, was great. was really great. I really, I really enjoyed uh, the articles there. Well, uh, I enjoyed Ricky and, um, and Kevin's articles, I should say. The... Um, well, we've got beneath that, there's a link to a page on our website uh, for our Christian News blog. We, um, every time we do podcasts, I post uh, uh, links to, I post a, a Christian News. Um, a, 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 I have a post filled with links of Christian News. Let me just say it that way. Um, and there was a, I'll tell you one story. There was a, um, a family that, uh, in Maryland that bought the house that inspired the exorcist story. It's just supposed to be a true story. It all took place in that house, supposedly. She's like, we ain't afraid of no ghost. <laughs> well, they're demons, they're not ghosts, but, you know, I would totally live in that house. I would totally live in that house. And I would tell the demonic realm, bring it, bring it, give it your best shot. Living in a house like that would be a great open door for ministry, you know. Um, tons of um, news about the, lot, tons of apostasy in the church, lots of COVID news, mandates and stuff like that. So check that all out. I got to see who's in the house. How you guys doing? Look at all the peeps here today on short notice. I love, it's awesome to see you. Uh, we'll start with Dan. Dan the man, the beautiful man whom I love dearly. How are you? Uh, are you prepared to refute the new wave of universalism coming in the right division? <laughs> I know who you're talking about. I uh, made a decision a couple days ago that uh, I was not going to talk about him. I think he wants attention. I've already marked and avoided him. He is an absolute total heretic, getting worse by the day. And um, I'm not going to give him the attention he craves, I decided. Uh, but... I mean, if you're going to fall for now, a pastor Hal, on the one hand, he looked at a lot of those comments. Uh, he's convinced it's a he, he's calling it a rope a dope. He thinks uh, this particular person is uh, just saying a bunch of nonsense to get attention, cause controversy, get everybody watching him, and uh, he is uh, uh, not uh, falling for uh, universalism. Uh, and he's like, I don't think he's really that dumb to fall for universalism. And I'm like, <laughs> you never know with Rodney. Oh, I didn't mean to say his name. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I get the impression. Um, I get the feeling he's uh, sometimes grasping at straws in order to just come up with some new heresy in order to... Uh, get attention, bring attention to himself, get more views, subscribers, that sort of thing. Uh, get people talking about him. I think there's, um, there's a lot of narcissism at play in, in the middle of all of that. Um, and I think the um, best thing the Grace Movement can do is just ignore him. Mark him, avoid him, and not even give him the time of day. Uh, we got William Barron's in the house. How you doing, man? Uh, my my dear brother, build a uh, build a Berean. Um, Karen uh, Gray is in the house. She says, "Don't get him started." That's right. Don't get me started. Um, it's great having you here. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're great. Um, we got church here. Awesome to see you. Um, Pastor Hal is. In the live chat to remind me that he is around watching so I don't make too many mistakes uh, and then Karen quotes uh, Romans 8 18 oh Dan says Joel's guest host bouquet of flowers a eh? right well visually it's just weird when there's nothing in the chair uh, Karen says Romans 8 18 for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us 
Is that not awesome? Is that not awesome? Sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The, uh, I remember one of the points that Sadler uh, made in his Light Affliction article, which also was um, a point I often like to make, is you, you, know, you consider Light Affliction, that's, that's, it's almost an overstatement. These are so light. These afflictions are so light. You think about a billion years from now, what is this moment that we're going through but a blip, barely a blink of an eye, barely a twinkle of an eye, this period that we're going through? And, uh, and yet, for the next billion years, there will be this glory emanating from us that is absolutely incomprehensible and, incompre and you can't compare it to any suffering in this world. That's one of the things that uh, I, still, I still find amazing, you know, about the rewards that God would give, that, that the Lord will give at the Bema Seat, because those rewards are eternal. You know, and the idea that some things that we do here in this life will have eternal reward, there's no comparison. You're being totally over-rewarded for every good service that you're being given because you can't quantify the value of something that's, that's, that's eternal. One thing he gives you that's eternal, like let's say, for example, the crown of righteousness, that in and of itself is of greater value than the sum total value of everything that exists in heaven and earth in the entire universe right now. Because there's going to come a time when heaven and earth are going to get burned. Well, earth, maybe not heaven. Uh, but still, it's eternal. Greater, greater value of that reward than everything that exists on the earth. Is that not amazing? And he, that doesn't even compare to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Is that not amazing? And not just the, the, the glory revealed in us, but, you know, the... It's, it's what that glory accomplishes for all eternity. That's what will give us joy about that glory. Because the glory that will be revealed in us is going to be used by the Father to showcase all of His grace, His kindness toward us through His Son. And that glory in us will be used to simply glorify His Son by the Father, for everything that he, the Christ accomplished on the cross and the way in which God the Father used the cross to give us eternal life in this brief period of grace before he brought judgment down onto the earth. Um, isn't that amazing? Uh, and then Karen quotes Romans 8, 21, because the creature itself shall... I'm sorry, because the creature all... <laughs> Still needs coffee. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption under the glorious liberty of the children of God. And you know those creatures, there's something to be said about... Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. And, th and that to me goes back to verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Well now, what is that? That is the moment when the creature itself will be delivered from bondage, the bondage of corruption, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What is the manifestation of the sons of God? I have a theory. When is it that the creature is going to be delivered from the, from the bondage of corruption? When the Lord returns. When he lifts the sin curse off of creation, off of all those poor animals that are burdened by the curse of sin. 
At the second coming, when Christ establishes his kingdom, is also, I think, the manifestation of all the sons of God, going all the way back to the beginning of time. I think that's the moment when you're going to have the resurrection of all the Old Testament saints. They're going to be resurrected into their glorified bodies here on the earth, filled with the Spirit. And then I think you'll also see the manifestation of the body of Christ in the heavenly seats. That moment, that manifestation of the sons of God, I, yeah, I would argue is more epic than the rapture. And I think, and that is also the moment, you know, that's when the Lord judges the nations. It's also the moment when he establishes his kingdom, permits who will go into that kingdom and who won't, and he will lift the sin curse off of creation. The desert shall blossom as a rose. Um, and I think um, that glorious liberty of the children of God, when the children of God, when all of us finally get those promises fulfilled, and we'll be free from sin, corruption, everything, living our lives in our uh, resurrection bodies, serving the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever roles we're given, it will be epic. Don't get me started. <laughs> I love that verse. Uh, and then we have uh, Romans 6, 8. Oh, don't get me. You're, she's really provoking me. Um, hey, Valerie, how you doing? Okay, Romans 6, 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Verse uh, 831. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. I love how you tied those two together. Right, right. And you know, when you have in Colossians 3, 1, you have Paul saying, well, if ye then be risen with Christ. Well, then you remember what Paul said in the previous chapter in Colossians 2, 12. Ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Right? So, you know, when he asked that question at the beginning of uh, Colossians 3, 1, you've already been given the answer. It's a, it's a, uh, a self-answering question kind of thing. I know there's a big technical grammatical term for that that Brian always uses, but uh, church says, uh, do not care for wealth or lust of the flesh, the pursuit of virtue in thankfulness for God and Jesus Christ is the gift of peace that passes all understanding. Wow. <laughs> and all the saints said, amen. Love that. Fantastic. Dude, that's, um, you know what, I might just steal it and maybe, may, may or may not give you credit for it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, some would say an attitude of gratitude. Um, I'm totally copying and pasting that. I don't know if I could squeeze that into my message tonight. That'd be kind of awesome. Uh, I don't know how you, I could squeeze that in with the uh, angel of the Lord. Uh, Maria J. Martin is in the house. How you doing, Maria? My little sweet Kerejito from Colorado. How are you? She says, good morning, dear Pastor Joel and dear saints. Good morning to you. A fine morning it is. Fred says, uh, Freddie Bear is in the, in the house. He says, greetings, dear saints, on my way to the cardiologist, trying to see what's going on. Heart rate's uh, been back in about 40 today. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let me see here. We will absolutely pray for everybody. And you. Maybe. <laughs> um, you take extremely good care of yourself. I love you, Fred. Uh, Bob Picard says, good morning, everyone. I was hoping Fred would be on this morning. Oh, well, I guess we'll have to settle with Joel. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Who says God doesn't chasten his people? <laughs> Who says God isn't teaching you stuff through experience? He's teaching you long-suffering. <laughs> Uh, 
I used to say that to everybody here. I'm like, you know, this that's that's my true ministry to everyone here is to teach them all long suffering. <laughs> um yeah, brother. Uh, Fred, we will absolutely pray for you. And Gwen, too. I know this isn't easy for her, the poor woman. Uh, we love you dearly. Now, let me see. Fred says, please don't get him started. That's right. That's right. Don't get me started. Um, high altitude, Charlie. Wah, wah, wah. Make it so, bro. That's right. That's right. Uh, Bob Card is going back to Philippians 3. 20 to 21. Well, you can't go wrong there, can you? For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. That's right. Now, you know, I have to say, a lot of people will take uh, Philippians 3.20. Um, and they'll say, you know, citizenship, community kind of thing. I think conversation is the right word here. You know, it is... I mean, certainly citizenship would be true. That's just a, a figurative expression of this Hebrew word. I think the, the meaning here is conversation of that Greek word. I'm not an expert, but I think this is properly translated. Yes, our citizenship is in heaven. It's actually in heavenly places, which would include the first, second, third heaven. Uh, but our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation, our... Um, interaction you know we uh, our dialect is heavenly because we are now heavenly creatures so we must converse in a way that mirrors heaven itself From whence we also look for the Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, in, in, who is ready for the rapture, who shall change our vile body. He's going to change that vile body of ours, transform it, make, so it'll be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Because God can do anything and even subdue all things to himself. I love that. And all of that comes, follows on the... Uh, uh, um, follows after the uh, my favorite verses in this chapter that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead total identification verses there this those verses are the reason why our conversation is in heaven because we're heavenly now we're heavenly creatures Uh, just like Humpty Dumpty sitting on the fence, we know the rest of the story. <laughs> um, William Barons, my dear brother. Hey, Gerard's in the house. How you doing? Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Which, you know, and I remember, I think um, a number of folks have brought it up. I think maybe Karen's mentioned this verse uh, recently, too. I mean, is this not uh, a truly relevant verse for us even right now, perhaps even in these last days of grace? Because where is your mind? If your mind is distraught by the news and the things that are going on, what are you focused upon? And Paul here directs your attention to focus on everything that's good, honest, true, sincere, beautiful, attractive, gorgeous, lovely. And if it's of good report, if it's virtuous, you know, we ha he has your mind continually meditating upon and judging all the things that are good in the world. 
You know, you're not you're not judging all the things that are bad, but you're you are here focused and judging upon all the things that are good. Well, is that thing I saw somebody do? Is that a good thing? Is that something I can model? You know, rather than being irate about the corruption and the horrific uh, bad things people are doing, meditate upon the good. To, you know, are those, those good things that you're thinking about worthy of uh, modeling in your own walk? And the point to the last days of grace is always going to be, where is your mind? What are you focused upon? What is important to you? What is your priority? Because is your priority, you know, oh, we got to fight to save these uh, civil liberties that we're losing, or are you going to do what Paul said in the uh, 2 Timothy 4, in the last days of grace, do the work of an evangelist? What's more important? If the Lord is going to be, if the Lord is literally at hand, and I think he is, What's the point of fighting for civil liberties? What difference is it going to make? Do you think that we are even... Let me ask you this. Do you think that we... How much longer do you think we really have before you've got a one world system and a mark of the beast? I mean, are we even talking five years? I don't even think it'll be that long. If, you, if, if the end of the world is literally upon us, and we're watching a trend of the world being conditioned for... Uh, you know, um, being conditioned for a mark and a, you got the whole passports and mandates and stuff going on and you can't buy or sell unless you have a passport and, you, uh, and you've got the technology now to do the hand scan or the face scan. You've got all of this stuff falling into place to fulfill scripture after the rapture. Literally, how much more time do we have? What is, is fighting for civil liberties worth it or, or, is it or is it better to fight for somebody to have eternal life? What's more important, having civil liberties that'll last maybe five years or giving somebody eternal life, life that is going to last for all eternity? What's more important? What's the bigger picture, civil liberties, religious liberties, or God's eternal purpose to glorify his son through the church when we take our heavenly seats? What God do you serve? What's important to you? You think... Um, and if you obsess about the misery that's going on, and there's probably going to be some misery coming here in the United States, no question about it. Where is your mind? What are you thinking about? I love that you brought that up, William. That's beautiful. That's awesome, dude. That really is. I hope you're great, man. <laughs> How says Joel's preaching this Wednesday morning. That's right. I was in the mood. I was in the mood. Um, Gerard says, Grace to ye all and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Greetings, saints of the Most High. Uh, Valerie says, Regarding lukewarm water, did you know it is opaque? It can't be seen through. But hot or cold water, you can see through. God wants to see through us, whether hot or cold. <laughs> um, oh, Hal's laughing about church. What did church say? Did I miss? Oh, yeah, I did miss it. Fred and Hal in the chat. Name a, a more iconic duo. That's right. That's right. Uh, literally, bet. Uh, <laughs> I won't say it. I won't say it. Uh, yeah, they are. It's uh, Batman and Robin, you know. <laughs> um, Laurel and Hardy. Um, what other dynamic duos are out there? Hilarious. Um, yeah, hot or cold, like the Laodicean church in Revelation. You know, God would rather you be, and it's amazing to me that God says he would, he would rather you take a stand, be either hot or cold, take a stand for something, either be for me or against me, because this lukewarm nonsense is annoying. <laughs> I always love that when the Lord went off on the Laodiceans, neither hot nor cold. <laughs> Just take, be a man and take a stand somewhere. <laughs> what is that? Isn't that in, um, is it two or three? I think it's in Revelation 3. The Laodiceans, yeah. 
And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the uh, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. <laughs> so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. <laughs> You're worthless. You can, you can be something. Right. Um, and why is it that they're lukewarm? Because they're rich. You have in um, verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and, and knowest not, that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in, in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Right. They're lukewarm because they don't want to do anything to upset the comfortable lifestyles they've, uh, to which they have grown accustomed because of their wealth. You know, so... Um, let me see here. Cliff, uh, Cliff Matthew. Hey, so we got Sean McGee. How are you, big guy? He says, good morning to all the wonderful saints. Good morning to you. Cliff Matthew says, good morning again, Dan. Uh, it's good to see you, my steep, rugged cliff, dear brother. Awesome having you here. Uh, oh, Valerie goes to Revelation 3. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Right. Leaves a bad taste in his mouth that you are neither hot nor cold. I have no problem with lukewarm food. I actually brought pizza just in case I go long today. So I may have me some lukewarm pizza. And uh, I will not spew that out of my mouth. Gerard says, as always, my lady, a uh, very sharp and excellent observation. That's hilarious. Gerard is uh, literally the most um, um, polite, well-versed, beautiful um, um, gentleman that we probably have in the live chat. Let me see here. What else we got? Having nothing more iconic than Christ, and Christ is just so evident in you, brothers. That's right. Aren't they amazing? I think they're legitimately amazing. Uh, Cliff says, I'm scared of heights. But I will be going up. <laughs> That's right. I'm scared of heights too, but I've always wanted to fly. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever dreamed of wanting to fly? Well, you're going to get a taste of that. You're going to take a ride on that Holy Spirit trans crazy transportation service. Valerie says, will Joel be back this evening? Yes. After this, he's going to go home and take a long nap. <laughs> and then we're, he'll be back this evening to talk about the angel of the Lord. Um, and uh, it's good. I've, I did a polish on it yesterday, and it's, uh, it's in great shape. Uh, I, I read, um, I had a couple of books on angels that I, I read. They all had sections on the angel of the Lord. Um, and I really didn't like anything anybody had to say about the angel of the Lord, truth be told. And so I, there's uh, 68 references to the angel of the Lord in, uh, in the Bible. Uh, in 64 verses, I looked at them all. That was great fun, you know. Um, and, uh, I, you know, you go through all those stories and you really pay attention to the angel of the Lord. You, you kind of glean some details that aren't uh, commonly um, discussed in angel books and stuff. Um, you know, I mean, there's the, the one occasion we'll talk about tonight, which uh, uh, Samson's dad asked the angel of the Lord what his name is, and he just flat out told him it's a secret. <laughs> which blew me away. Blew me away. It's a secret. Angel of the Lord meets Hagar. Hagar, when she was on the run, Hagar asked him what his name is. She, he wouldn't tell her. And you have the moment when uh, Jacob was wrestling with God. And I think that was perhaps a Christophany. It was Jacob was literally wrestling with the angel of the Lord. Even though Genesis 32 doesn't say angel of the Lord. 
but he knew, he figured out quickly he was wrestling with the Lord. And the Lord touched his thigh, and he it was immediately out of joint. And uh, But Jacob wouldn't let him go. And the Lord told him, let me go. I, it's break of dawn. I got to go, dude. And uh, he says, no, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He knew he was wrestling with the Lord. And he asked him what his name is. And the uh, Lord just sort of shrugged it off. Why would you ask me that? And then he blessed him. <laughs> it was just <laughs> It is possible to discover lots of new stuff that you, you've probably read before and hadn't really paid much attention to, and it's just, um, it blew me away. Why would God? And that's one aspect of the uh, message tonight, is just why would God, the Lord, come into the world and manifest as a man in some fashion and call himself the angel of the Lord and then refuse to give his name? to reveal himself to the people with whom he interacted. Why would he do that? Well, we'll talk about that tonight. But it's so strange. Why would the Lord call himself the angel of the Lord? That's a question I had for a long time. You know, angel of the Lord, messenger of Jehovah. Well, why would Jehovah call himself a messenger of Jehovah? Why would he do that? Makes no sense. <laughs> well, it does if you really study it out and think about it and talk to people about it and stuff and read books. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll cover that tonight. Um, Church says, love this Chad, love you all. Dude, I love you way more. I love you way more. Cliff says, uh, that would be burning the candle at both ends, Val. Yes, it would. I'm taking tomorrow off, by the way. I'm going gonna, uh, gonna to try to finish my messages for Brian's conference tomorrow. Um, oh, I cannot wait. I had a message from uh, Blake Donaldson, uh, Amy Stewart. Uh, I'm literally just sitting on pins and needles, like counting the days until I could see Brian Ross and Becky. And the people of his church. I cannot wait. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to spend some time with the Reeds. I literally cannot wait. Um, and, uh, you know, I got to say, man, I was thinking last night after um, David did his Q&A, um, he called and uh, we just chatted for a while. And, I, you know, this doesn't get said enough, I don't think. But isn't it amazing you have, the, uh, you have these men who could have really gone high places. I mean, they've got brilliant minds. They could be anything they wanted to be. And what did they want to do? They wanted to teach the truth. They wanted to be a grace pastor because they cared about the truth. You know, being a grace pastor, you don't, <laughs> you get a lot of hate. You, you, don't, you don't get a lot of money. You don't get money. You get... Um, you know, you're sacrificing a lot. You think David Osteen, he's a great preacher. He could have been one of the biggest, most popular Southern Baptist preachers out there. He's that good, I think. Uh, but no, he gave it all up. Nearly got fired nine times at his church, lost all, a lot of his people, uh, had to leave the church building. He's not turning back. He wanted to preach the truth. He was willing to suffer that loss because he wanted to preach the truth. And he knew, and they all know, that the truth is better news than anything you find in religion, and it's worth your time. But, you know, David Reed could have been, you know, big-time lawyer, could have been one, uh, you know, he could have really gone places, but that man loves the truth enough that he wants to spend time to study and, and teach and share that truth with others. I mean, those men are amazing. You know, we really are blessed to have these men. And I know everybody's got favorite uh, pre preachers. Uh, you know, I love them all. And I know not every grace pastor has run well. There have been a lot of scandals and things. And one in particular who is misbehaving right now. But how blessed are we that we still have these men like Brian and David and David Osteen and you know, all these guys, Ted Fellows and Steve Ross and, um, uh, and well, Jordan and Hal and Fred and um, 
and I could go on and on and on. Everybody, Josh Trelecki, I got to mention him. I love that boy. How amazing. How amazing that they were willing to give up their time and money to be able to sh share the truth with others because that was more important than anything else. I just found myself just moved last night. I was so tired. I was, I get, uh, I get emotional anyway, get sentimental when I'm tired, but man, how blessed are we? Those guys are amazing. So I'm not afraid, I'm not embarrassed to be a fanboy of some Grace Pastors. Um, let me see here. Uh, Cliff says uh, maybe some cold pizza will help Joel preach this evening. Yes, it will. And that is going to be my uh, fuel tonight, without a doubt. Um, got some uh, Marco's pizza. Marco's, um, Marco's is down the road, and they do uh, what they call pizza bowls. It's just all pizza stuff without the dough in a bowl. <laughs> and it's really good. Cheese and pepperoni and sauce and... You know, um, I don't know, green peppers, all that stuff, all mixed up together in a bowl. And you just eat it. And it's without the dough. It's awesome. So, you know, you want to do something creative, make yourself a pizza bowl. Uh, Ludus is in the house. How are you? Ludus. So awesome to see you. Um, keeping you and Rafi in our prayers, as always, as well as all the saints in, in Puerto Rico. Um, the saints that are in Puerto Rico, not Maria J. Martin, who is no longer in Puerto Rico, even though she is Puerto Rican. Uh, but uh, I hope you're doing great. I hope you're doing great. Church says, uh, no one likes cold pizza, Cliff. It's an excuse people make to be lazy. You, ha Church has no idea what he's saying, does he? Uh, if they truly liked cold pizza, they'd put the one they ordered in the fridge before eating it or wait longer to pick it up. That's literally what I did yesterday. <laughs> I didn't, I, you know, I had, um, I love cold pizza. I hate the microwave, so I've learned to love cold foods. I don't trust the microwave, so I, um, so yeah, so I didn't, uh, we got pizza, but I didn't eat, eat the pizza for a long time. I had it in the fridge before I finally had some. And then, um, you know. Uh, cold pizza is the best. I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, let me see here. Church says, hey, I'd like to order a pizza for delivery, but take your time. I like it cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, Grace Faith is here. Oh, I bet I know who Grace Faith is. Uh, I'll attend to one that might be a certain Kate Deco, the beautiful woman from Ohio. Glorious, good, glorious morning, Pastor Joel. Big, tight hugs and much love. Let's go. <laughs> awesome to see you. I love you to death. I hope you're doing great. Give your, give, um, you know, just, um, just imagine me giving you a great big hug. Sandra Briggs is in the house. Valerie, you take good care of Sandra Briggs is in the house. I cannot wait to meet David and Se David Reed and Stephanie soon. <clears throat> they they uh, they do not disappoint. Literally, they do not disappoint. <clears throat> Lourdes says, uh, I am always here in the podcast, though I don't chat much. Love to know all that you post and uh, talk to each other. And of course, learn more. You're beautiful. Beautiful. Do you see Miguel Ortiz much? You got to give that man a great big hug and kiss for me. Totally. Cliff Matthews says, uh, oh, Chiyuda's here. Did I miss that? A wonderful Boston Bertucci lover. Where's Chuyita? Uh I am so sorry I missed that. Well, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Grace Faith, uh, good morning. Our mad, bad, precious brother, Dan, whom I love so much. It's great to see you. Joel, you're the one who persuaded me to look. <laughs> Oh, Dan, you the man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rusty, R-R-O-I, Valerie says. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, it's definitely corroded, corrupted. <laughs> Rod, that's for sure. Um yeah, I got a number of texts about it, and um, and I know there's a, 
um, a lot of people are scratching their heads, not quite sure. It's one of those things where he's going to make you listen to him for a dozen messages before you finally, I don't know, get a sense of where he stands. And he'll say a lot of things all over the map that uh, sometimes would say things that would make you think he is leaning in that direction. Uh, when ultimately he's not, he's just, he's just um, I think Hal's right. I think it's a, a rope-a-dope scheme in order to get attention. And I think the best thing the Grace Movement can do is to not give it to him. Um, but there will be no debate in the, <laughs> I don't think there's going to be much of a debate in the grace movement about universalism because there is no debate. <laughs> Anybody that falls for that nonsense is, um, I remember who somebody told me that, um, I can't remember who it was, that somebody was saying that they were almost on the brink of accepting universalism, but there were some certain chat there were it was second thessalonians one that persuaded that that just said i can't i can't get past these verses these verses are just a slam dunk there's no way universalism will ever be true because <clears throat> he's because it's the you know where you have you know in the in second thessalonians one he's, those saints were being persecuted and he tells them to find comfort in thinking about what the lord's going to do to them at the second coming that's how bad the persecution was. And he tells them in verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's all you got to read to a universalist and drop them. That's a drop the mic, walk away. Done. There's nothing to debate after reading that verse. No amount of words is going to make those, that verse not say what it very clearly says. Everlasting destruction, you know, uh, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no disputing these verses here. It's, there's nothing, as Hal would say, there's nothing ambiguous about those passages. <laughs> so, yeah, good luck. Good luck. Um... Sandra Briggs, now there's a narcissist if you want to talk narcissism. <laughs> uh, yep. Yep. Sandra knows what she's talking about. Smarty pants. <laughs> Bob says, who's Rodney? <laughs> you can go meet him. You don't live too terribly far, brother. <laughs> Forgive me. He is uh, not a nice man. You know, that's, that reminds me. It's been a long time since we've done that, you know, really, Dan, really thing. We kind of we kind of drifted out of that, but we had a had a period for all the newbies out there who, who may not have heard. We had a period where <laughs> uh, this particular individual was rather upset with me and went took to the pulpit and let me have it. <laughs> And uh, and we had a, um, I guess apparently we had a few podcasts in which we were debating whether or not uh, it was right or wrong for Paul to go to Jerusalem at the end of Acts. And uh, somebody, I, somebody had said that it was a lapse in judgment. Uh, that's I, I, it was either Fred or Hal. It's not. It's just not a kind of expression I I would use. So somebody else had to have said it. But I nonetheless agree. Uh, I was not sure what I thought about it at the time. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, when Paul was, was, Saul was converted on the road to Damascus, the Lord told him, do not go to Jerusalem. You know, you had the Holy Spirit in, uh, what was it, chapter 21? Before he went into Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit told him, don't go to Jerusalem. And then when he was in Jerusalem, the, the Lord told him, get out. They won't receive thy testimony concerning me. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe don't go to Jerusalem. <laughs> oh, and then Rodney got on there and he, he, uh, he was mad at me for you know, critic, being critical of him on the judgment seat of Christ. Heard me talk, heard us talking about that and just let me have it about that and said, really, Joel, really? A lapse in judgment? Really, Joel, really? <laughs> and then he called me purely and totally ignorant of the word of God. <laughs> so, you know, 
we knew and we knew how we were going to react we had already we, we've we, we planned before we even started the podcast how we would react to online criticism just respond in love get back in, and i just got back online and said i love you you're wrong <laughs> but i love you I, if, if um and there were times when i was hard on rodney in the on the podcast so uh what he taught was heresy absolute heresy and he's continually drifting uh towards more heresy it would seem uh and i i never really spent a lot of time listening to a lot of those different messages that he gave i mean it's just the very i stuck with the premise the premise being in order to understand you know like the word fire in order to understand who paul is talking to verse by verse whether he's talking to us or the little flock then you have to understand the history of the word fire in the bible and go through the entire history of that word in order to be able to understand that when paul re references fire in first corinthians 3 he is somehow talking to the little flock dumbest thing i ever heard in my life absolute bonkers bonkers total balderdash you know and so then with that premise, he then began to just tear apart Paul's epistles and his verses. And there were some verses where he would just literally, you know, like the verse about uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. He would literally go, this word is for us. This word is for the little flock. This word's for us. This word's for the little flock. I... <laughs> You know, and I know of people uh, who, you know, they just got to a point where they were so confused. They looked at their Bibles and they're reading Paul's letters and they honestly didn't know if Paul was even talking to them. They, they, they just they didn't know how to. And, and the other problem with that is that everybody relies on him in order to get an interpretation of Scripture to know who Paul is talking to from verse to verse. Does that scream like a system designed to feed a narcissist's ego? Absolutely. Just complete and total. I mean, it's, I hate to say it, but it's just nonsense. Total nonsense. Unfounded. Unbiblical. And nobody in the entire history of Christianity has ever taught that you need to study the Bible that way. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm, it, really that premise is all you need to know. Uh, so then uh, I heard he had drifted towards saying, well, Paul was preaching one, a different gospel uh, up until Acts 28 and then a different gospel afterwards. I don't know. I don't know. I remember Brian had a number of messages that he did which were excellent. Um, I talked to Brian into saying I love Rodney a number of times in that series. It was excellent, excellent series. Um, and uh, Brian essentially said that, you know, I mean, he, he actually divides Paul's epistles up to a greater extreme than even the Acts 28 uh, crowd would have dreamed. Even worse than um, Charles Welsh, Welsh would have ever divided up Paul's epistles. Far more extreme. In fact, you get to the point where he's ripped out so much of Paul's epistles as being to uh, uh, the little flock. There's almost nothing left for us, according to him. Um, so, uh, I'll just say, really, Valerie, really? <laughs> um, uh, really, Sandra, really? <laughs> really, Bob, really? Hey, Chris Nelson's here. How you doing, man? Hey, 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 love you all. Dark and rainy here this morning, but the sun, S-O-N, the sun is shining all the time. Yes, he is, isn't he? Oh, man, the sun is shining bright. And you know, uh, it gets brighter the more we... Uh, uh, seek and set our affection on those things above, man. How you doing? How you feeling? How's your family? How's Utah treating you? Um, I hope you're doing great. I really do. Uh, do do do. Bertucci rolls are better than better than cold pizza. <laughs> uh huh. Hey, Lion and Judah's in the house. Look at there. How you doing? How can I get in touch with Joel? Lion, will you have, um, look, here's my, here's my email address. I've given this out before, dude. Yeah. Um, 
And I hope you understand I don't uh, time is time is limited for me. I will inter I will interact, but I don't I don't I, I can't spend all day writing. Uh, but uh, there is uh, there's my email address there if you need it. Um, I don't know of anybody. What are we in Facebook? I don't have any anything pending in my Facebook. I don't know what. Um, Yeah, I don't. I don't know what that would be. Um, I haven't gotten anything on Facebook. Dan says, if you all want to know who Charlie is, you will have to listen to Bob's last message. Uh, fantastic. Cliff says, uh, Dan, is that the one where Bob was distracted by food smells? Uh, yes. <laughs> that right there is worth. Um, that right there is worth. Um, uh, Watching, uh, that's a good enough reason to watch Bob right there. Food smells. I love watching, seeing him distracted. That'd be awesome. But, uh, uh, Bob quotes Daniel 12 too. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting uh, contempt. Um, there is a, uh, there's a verse I love. I think it's in Ezekiel 37. Yeah, I think it's Ezekiel 37, 12. Is my favorite verse about the resurrection of the Old Testament saints because therefore prophesy and say unto them thus saith the Lord God behold O my people I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel and ye shall Pardon me. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you. And ye shall live, and I shall place you in your land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. <laughs> That's epic, epic. I love those verses because they're, um, and the, the, I mean, it's not just the fact that they will uh, be resurrected from their graves and they're going to be given their glorified bodies, but he also confirms there that they're all going to be filled with the Spirit all throughout the kingdom. Another reason I love Ezekiel 37. Uh, trying to get folks to listen. Time is short. Uh, that's right. That's the way it should be. Well done. Great. Phenomenal. Dan says, remember that with the knowledge of the truth, we are the tip of the spear, and thus we are seeing all the changes taking place in this world. That's right. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. The tip of the spear, and we are got a great big target on our back a whole um, demonic realm trying to set things up for the final showdown uh, and uh, and once it's all over we're gonna party like it's Revelation 19.9 okay Deco says okay back to normal now how you doing Good morning, all the mad, bad, precious, uh, and beautiful saints whom I love so much. Big tight hugs. Lion says, I need uh, prayer for my health. Pray I can stay healthy enough to continue to spread the gospel to as many as possible. I will absolutely pray and, and express hope that you get better. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, you have to understand, too, there were, in fact, uh, I have a whole series on uh, suffering. And, um, you know, we have been appointed to suffer. And it does not, there are no guarantees that you're going to be, 
your health is going to be cured or you're going or it's going to improve but what you have especially in second uh, Corinthians 12 you have uh, the Paul having some kind of an issue and the uh, he begs the Lord three times to have this problem removed from him what that problem is I, nobody really knows some thinks it, it was physical infirmities uh, some think that um, you know, that problem had to do with maybe, uh, it, you know, because it was talking about a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him, so it might be a, a demon that was tormenting him or maybe a demon-possessed person that was tormenting him and for whatever reason, driving him crazy. And he begged the Lord three times to have this thing removed. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient, right? My grace is sufficient. His grace was, uh, you know, empowerment that made him able to endure the suffering with joy and the um, and in that series I go through you know that particular section quite a bit um, and the you know and it's it's that God allowed Paul to to suffer with this thorn in the flesh you know um, he allowed him to suffer uh, and uh, um, the Lord told Paul that his grace would be sufficient for him. His grace would carry him through all his trials. His grace would empower him. His grace would be the means by which he can endure all long suffering with joy. And his grace would enable Paul to serve Christ with power. While we want sometimes want the Lord to fix our problems, help us with our health, which I can, uh, those are. Uh, you know, interests that are totally understandable. What the Lord wants us to know is that the sufficiency of His grace and the magnificence of His power working in our souls so that we, like Paul, can say, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, Paul's whole attitude about suffering changed. You know, he learned to actually take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in necessities, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Taking pleasure in infirmities. How many of us can uh, be, be legitimately honest <coughs> that we're taking pleasure in the struggles that we're going through? I mean, have you, have you reached that level of grace yet in your walk where you go through hard times and you're taking pleasure in it Ooh. that is that is some i mean that is hardcore true hardcore spiritual maturity to a level that you actually take pleasure in the infirmities you're going through and take one of the things that um well, and I'll just say this, uh, and this is a point that I learned from Hal years ago, was just the fact that God doesn't show his love to us through our circumstances either. And we have to keep that in mind too. He does not show his love to us through our circumstances. He showed his love to us through the sacrifice of his son. He showed his love to us also by everything he made us in his son. By giving us a free gift of eternal life, just by simply believing, by blessing us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, by literally just showering his grace on us, all of which enabled us and empowered us to be able to endure and suffer long with joy. Um, you probably know all that stuff, but there may be others who... Uh, who uh, who uh, might be might be uh, new to them? Sandra Briggs says I'm learning this lesson well. Long suffering. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's uh, I did a in that suffering series. I did a whole message on um, long suffering, and one of the my favorite aspects of long suffering was the fact that long suffering long suffering tells you that the, of, of the likelihood that you know you're not going to immediately get fixed and cured the problems aren't immediately going to be you know go away and you it is God's design for you to master long suffering and that includes forbearance and patience in order to be a master of long suffering 
And not just that, but long suffering isn't just simply, you know, having the patience to endure something that's bad. Long suffering, truly mastering long suffering, is to recognize the fact that there is an end game in mind. There is always an end game in mind, a reason why you're suffering long. You know, the, uh, there's that little verse that uh, Peter shared, you know, at the end of 2 Peter 3, talking about, as Paul had already told them and the, and the believing remnant of Israel, that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. Long suffering, it, you know, it, long suffering is not forever suffering. Long suffering is simply suffering long, but it always it has an end game in mind. There's a reason why it's willing to suffer long, and that end game is always salvation. So, why we live in this age of grace that is characterized by the long suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ about sin. He's suffering long so that souls may be saved. Long suffering has an end game. But it does not. But long suffering does not suffer forever either. Um, I love that point about long suffering. There's a lot more I could say, but I I could see there's a lot of comments here. Um, <laughs> I love Gerard's icons as much as I love his words. Uh, that's just hilarious. Thunderbirds are go. Lift up your heads. That's right. Totally. Totally. Maybe tonight, Gerard, Cliff says, yeah, maybe, well, no, hopefully after, the, after I do the message. I spent a lot of hours on the angel of the Lord. <laughs> um, K. Dika says, long-suffering is my middle name. Uh, thank God for it all with a joyous heart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, when it comes to long-suffering, I think of Chris Henry. Chris Nelson. Sorry. Chris Henry. Chris Nelson. I mean, that man has pain every single day. And he is, uh, and yet you see his great spirit and his attitude, his tone when he, when he interacts with us. He's just a beautiful, beautiful man. Um, let me see here. The, you remember in um, 2 Timothy 3, uh, speaking of long suffering, you have the uh, in Second Timothy three. You have the Pauline prophecies about the perilous times, the last days of grace. You have him talking about the what man uh, generally, the characteristics of man generally, and then you go halfway down that chapter, and you Second uh, Timothy three ten. You have but you know Paul tells Timothy he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose. Faith, long suffering, charity, patience. And this is one way that we endure the last days of grace. We remember Paul's doctrine, you know. We remember his manner of life, his purpose, his faith. <clears throat> and we also remember, you know, how Paul exemplified that fine art of long suffering. You know, we made the point, too, my doctrine is the cause here in that verse, my doctrine. My doctrine is the cause, and all the other eight characteristics after that are the result, because the sound doctrines of grace will define your manner of life as it did Paul's, right? The sound doctrines of grace will define your purpose in life as it did Paul's. You know, the, the sound doctrines of grace will define your faith as it did Paul's. The sound doctrines of grace will enable you to master long-suffering, enable you to become a model of charity, exhibiting the attributes of agape love itself. The sound doctrines of grace will enable you to also become patient like Paul and enable you even to the degree of enduring with joy persecutions and afflictions that we just might have to face before the Lord comes. And we remember God's marching orders for us. You remember 2 Timothy 4.2, or 4, 2, sorry. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. 
Now, why, and here's a question. Why do we have to exhort with all long-suffering? Exhort with all long-suffering. Well, sometimes people uh, don't react well to the doctrine, you know, but we suffer long with patience, exhorting them to believe. And we suffer long with that patience, forbearance, and love so that they may come around to the truth. We exhort with long, long suffering because they're not going to accept it the first time they hear it. And you've got to exhort with love and patience toward them. Um, you know, when Paul and I, when we did that series on long suffering, um, Oh, I'm sorry, did the series on suffering, and then there was a, a message on long-suffering. You know, Paul wasn't, when he suffered, when he endured hard times, when he was severely afflicted, he wasn't simply focused on just getting through the suffering. He was also focused on pureness of his life, knowledge of Scripture, long-suffering. That was a central focus of his while he was going through persecution and afflictions and trials and, and sufferings. And he was also focused on kindness. So, but he was, he was focused on patience, you know? And what is patience? It's that, that calm temper with which you wait long to get through that suffering. And he's also focused on forbearance, which was a, you know, a command of temper. The restraint of acting in the flesh Long-suffering, patience, forbearance, they're all distinct and they're all interconnected when it comes to, uh, to long-suffering because to master the art of long-suffering is to also master the art of patience and forbearance. Plus, um, long-suffering is part of the very nature of love itself, agape love. Agape love, the nature of that love is to suffer long. That's what love does. And I had uh, at one point looked at the forbearance of um, the long suffering of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can see evidence of all the long suffering of all three in Paul's epistles. And us suffering long with joyfulness, it it puts on display to everyone around us the fact that his life is manifest in us. Puts on display the fact that we intimately know God because we are exhibiting an attribute that's common amongst the entire Godhead, triune Godhead, the capacity to suffer long with joy. And we know that long-suffering isn't meaningless. It isn't without purpose. Long-suffering has an end game in mind, and that end game is the salvation of souls. You know, Just as this dispensation is characterized by the long-suffering of the Lord, just as Paul taught Peter and the Jews that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, so too our long-suffering may lead to the salvation of people we know. I'll just leave it at that. Man, I can smell it. I'm going to have to. I may just totally munch on pizza because I may go long. Um, let's see here. Doesn't that look amazing? Is that not amazing? It has one of those uh, Parmesan crusts. It's a supreme pizza. It is terrifically lukewarm. Bob Picard says, conversation, manner of life. Love it. Exactly. <laughs> your, your comment articulates with more simplicity what I was trying to say. I love that comment. Thank you, brother. Dan says, amen, Bob. Keep our minds on heavenly places in Christ. That's right. 
That's right. Cliff says, blinded by the light. Karen says, Neil sends his love. Yeah, well, you uh, if you get a chance to interact with him, let him know. We got a thousand times more love for him. We send it all right back. Kay says, I was listening to my precious times past brother in Christ, Michael Criswell video. He mentioned how once he stopped watching uh, videos of things going on in the world, he felt such peace. Me too. Right. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I had, um, uh, there are some days after a podcast, I, uh, I like to take a break and then I'll listen to, um, uh, like a David Knight. He's a Christian libertarian, a pundit talking about the things going on in the world. And, uh, but then there are most days, uh, as soon as I get home, I might have a lunch, quick break, and then I'll dive right into scripture. And then the whole afternoon is spent studying to prepare for something, you know, whether it's a Wednesday night, a backup message for Sunday, or working on messages for a conference. I, you know, and by the time I'm done, you know, that's around, you know, sometimes 7.30, 9 o'clock, because then I got to start getting ready for the podcast the next day. And that... I, I can't even tell you how gratifying and satisfying it is to spend that much time, <coughs> that much time in the Word. There, I, I don't, I don't know of anything more satisfying than that in life. Certainly for me. Sometimes my brain's not functioning and it doesn't want to <laughs> read. Uh, I, I honestly don't know what is more satisfying and more refreshing in life than to see. And to actually spend one-on-one -on -one time in the Word. I, I don't know. If it, that, that's, that just literally gives me peace. Because even if you're studying the Old Testament, you know, I, even if it's a different program, there are still examples of what not to do, models of inspirational stories of faith. And then you also see in the Old Testament the consistency in God's character and who He is and how He operates. Um, yeah, so those days I skipped, I skipped the pundit and I, um, you know, study all day. I, phew, those are the best. Gerard says, uh, I don't know, Broadcliff, but the upcoming days, just as the whole doctor October month is a high watching period, just saying regarding the timeline, just watch, right? There's a lot about October that worries me. I suspect this month may be the month where we might have some really harsh economic conditions. And if you have none, I say prep. You need to prep because it's coming. Um, Karen says, revved up like a deuce, another runner in the night. Right. Um, Dan says, Joel, did you get banned from David Reed's channel for trolling? <laughs> um, well, I got, a, I, I got a phone call afterwards, and I thought I might be in trouble, but I was like, well, I don't think I said anything too terribly bad. Uh, Karen said, how about discussing today's uh, Two Minutes with the Bible, The Nature of the Beast? Yes, I have a link to that uh, beneath the video. Um, I've seen that article before. The, um, the Two Minutes with the Bible... They do kind of repeat themselves. Um, what is that article here? I got it here. Oh, here we go. Nature of the Beast. Um, he quotes uh, Titus 1.12. Uh, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Crescens are evil beasts, right? He says when a, a Christian prophet said that the Crescens are evil beasts, he was saying that they were men who despise government, brute beasts who speak evil of dignities. Men who uh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities as brute beasts, Jude 1. Uh, uh, well, sorry, Jude 8 to 10, I should, should say. A wild beast refuses to let a man oppose his will on him, 
So men who won't let civil rulers impose their will on them are called beasts. Uh, when Paul added, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. He was asserting that it is impossible to resist the powers that be in government and still be considered sound in the faith. Uh, we see further evidence that this was a problem in Crete when Paul later told Titus, uh, Titus 3.1, uh, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to speak evil of no man. Um, uh, he goes through a number of other examples here, too. This is he, the article that he had in last month's searchlight was very similar. Um, and there was, I think, last week, he might have actually taken that article and had put that in the email, uh, email repertoire also. Um, there's a lot to be said about it. There's been a lot of discussion about all of that in um, in Christendom. You had um, where's my three things? Where's my and I had last week a choice between doing that message on O oh Man of God or three stories on civil disobedience. Uh, where's it? Where are we at here? Um, and I think I mentioned this before. Uh, actually, let me get my other other one out. Romans thirteen is not a a a chapter that means you do everything the government tells you to do. There was a guy uh, on um, it's on the YouTube. Uh, it's called Wretched Radio. He's a big Calvinist and he's got a huge following. He's also kind of a comedian. And he got into a lot of hot water with a lot of Calvinists um, a couple weeks ago because he basically said Romans 13 tells you that uh, if the government tells you to put a propeller on your head, then that's what you're going to do. You're going to put a, pro a propeller on your head. And then he got a lot of flack for that. There were all kinds of articles about it on the Christian news sites. He, then he doubled down and um, he basically pulled out this old commentary from MacArthur <laughs> and uh, and um, MacArthur said, yeah, if you're under Genghis Khan, if you're under Stalin, you submit. No exceptions. You know, this, and this, he, it's some old 1980s commentary where he quotes MacArthur. MacArthur, who last year committed civil disobedience against the state of California. Right? What, 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 <laughs> it makes no sense. Um, there was also... Do I have, I think I have a, um, sorry, sorry, let me get my other thing here. There's a sermon from 1750 that's worth reading. I read this a couple weeks ago. Where is it at? Oh, here we go. Where's the link to that? Oh, here we go. The, uh, it's called a, it's by Jonathan Mayhew from 1750, this was a great inspiration for the uh, founding fathers of the country, and it was a, a, uh, a sermon called A Discourse Concerning Unlimited Submission and Non-Resistance to the Higher Powers. And he makes the point in this sermon, you know, it's all about Romans 13, and he says, and he, and he says well, if, if the powers that be are designed to be a terror to evil, what do you do when the powers that be become a terror to the good? Uh, and one of the quotes he makes here, he says, Here the apostle argues that those who resist a reasonable and just authority, which is agreeable to the will of God, do really resist the will of God himself and will therefore be punished by him. But how does this prove? that those who resist a lawless, unreasonable power which is contrary to the will of God do therein resist the will and ordinance of God. Is resisting those who resist God's will the same thing with resisting God? Or shall those who do so receive to themselves damnation? For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for evil. 
And here the apostle argues more explicitly than he had before for revering and submitting to magistrate. From this consideration that such as really perform the duty of magistrates would be enemies only to the evil actions of men and would befriend and encourage the good and so be a common blessing to society. But how is this an argument that we must honor and submit to such magistrates as are not enemies to the evil actions of men but to the good? And such as are not a common blessing but a common curse to society. <laughs> So, I'd say consider that. Now, the point of um, Romans 13. It does not mean that you are, uh, that you must do everything the government tells you to do. It is simply a, um, a statement that's basically saying you don't ever refuse to acknowledge their right to rule. You accept them as your rulers. You accept them as the uh, having a th proper authority from God with a, with a godly purpose to do that. Um, you know, uh, Paul reiterates this, uh, that very principle in Titus 3.1 that um, Ricky had quoted. The Cretans were to be, Titus was to put the Cretans in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Um, and so what is that, one of the great cross-references to that, I think, is uh, Romans 8, 7. You know, the carnal mind, you know, the whole idea of being subject. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It is this idea that Paul has in mind with, I think, uh, civil governments. This means that in Romans 8, 7 meant that the carnal mind of the unbeliever didn't recognize the law of God, didn't acknowledge the authority of the law of God, refused to be put under the law of God, will not allow itself to be conscious in any way of the law of God, much less be subservient to the law of God. Right? So that carnal mind will run wild doing whatever it wants regardless of God's will. So the point is that we as believers, we, we recognize the government as having proper authority over us and that we are willing to submit ourselves under that authority. That doesn't mean we do any evil thing that the government, if the government were to tell you to do evil thing, you resist. We are put on this earth to resist evil. And you consider, I had an outline of... Um, I have three stories of civil disobedience, and I won't go through this whole 45-minute sermon here. Actually, probably longer. But, of course, you consider, you know, the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think in that story you get a very simple illustration of basic illustration of all tyranny all at the heart of all tyranny is idolatry and vanity and then you look at Shadrach Meshach and Abednego you look at how they responded to Nebuchadnezzar um, you know you, it has to be said they committed civil disobedience they they submitted themselves to the powers that be while also embodying the proper method of civil disobedience. They did not reject the government. They didn't try to overthrow the government. They did not once assert that Nebuchadnezzar had no right to rule over them. They didn't reject all the laws. They only resisted those commandments of men, those specific commandments of men that were forcing them to betray the will of God. And they were also willing to submit to the punishment of the government. But they would not betray their faith. And they spoke truth to power to that effect. And so, of course, God miraculously saved them. You also have the story in Daniel 6. We've talked about this before. You had the spies that were watching him, looking for an excuse to kill him. But they couldn't find any because his walk was flawless. So what did they do? They changed the law to force him to betray his faith. And I just love how Daniel, uh, you know what, <laughs> um, after, the, after they changed the law, basically forbidding him to pray, he had to submit his request to uh, the king before he would, would be allowed to pray. And, 
And I remember how uh, Daniel 6, 6, 10 had said, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He just simply did not change his routine. He continued to pray to God as he always did. And even in the midst of knowing that there were spies watching him and knowing that he was probably going to go to jail, probably going to get killed because of the new laws that were forcing him to betray his faith, he, he, when he prayed, he still thanked God. What a model example he was. But again, it has to be said, it has to be pointed out in the example of Daniel's civil disobedience. Daniel submitted himself to the powers that be while also embodying the proper method of civil disobedience. He didn't reject the government. He didn't try to overthrow the government. He, he didn't once assert that Darius had no right to rule over them. He didn't reject all the laws. He only resisted that specific law brought about in sheer corruption that was forcing him to betray the will of God. And Daniel was also willing to submit to that punishment, but he wouldn't betray his faith. Um, so my bigger point is that with Ricky Kurth, both with this article that he had posted recently, as with the article he had in last month's searchlight, it's all obey government. Without any, he doesn't even address the whole idea of civil disobedience. But Romans 13 just simply means that you don't reject the government. You willingly submit yourself to the government. You don't try to overthrow the government. You're not about causes of taking over the government. You're not about, uh, um, it, it, you know, um, uh, acts of terror and anarchy and all this and You submit to government. But when the government forces you to do something that forces you to betray your faith, then you re resist that specific commandment and speak truth to power, and then be willing to submit yourself to the punishment. That's what it means. The fact that Ricky Kurth won't address it, uh, I don't know. I think it's, it's not that Ricky Kurth is, well, I'll let it go. But, you know, I read these articles and I feel, you know, it is dangerous to tell people that you got to do everything the government tells you to do. And it's not that, you know, I'm not, you know, I and, and I... There is a, um, you know, I, th I, I watched a, um, I watched a movie, a really old movie from the 60s that had Orson Welles in it called Is Paris Burning? And I often wonder, if I was in France under the German occupation, would I be involved in the resistance? I don't know. If I was in the shoes of Corrie ten Boom in, what was it, Holland, would I be doing what she was doing? trying to save the lives of Jews, hiding them, protecting them, trying to get them resettled to a safe place. Yeah, I just might. I just might. Um, but um, there you go. You got me on a tirade there. Don't get me started, Karen. <laughs> and I'll say this too. During the lockdowns, the excuse that MacArthur and others was using to defy uh, the state government was total bunk. Um, he was saying, well, no, God commanded you, has commanded us to go to church, and we now seek to obey God. God never commanded you to go to church. That is total bunk. That is total legalism, a perverted twisting of scripture, and they were never justified in their, um, in their civil disobedience. Give me a verse that would have justified what they're doing. Now, they could, it's not that, I mean, it's, it seems very transparent and obvious to me what's, what's actually going on with all of this, and I think they were able to see it, but you can't defend it from scripture. Uh, and he's saying, um, you know, they would use uh, Hebrews 10.25 as a means of justifying civil disobedience by taking this verse, twisting it around to mean that God has commanded us to go to church. No, he hasn't. This verse says, Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. 
but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That verse is not a commandment to go to church. That verse isn't talking to us. It's talking to the believing remnant who will be studying this book during the tribulation. And it's not a commandment to go to church. This is about just don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together, which is a completely different concept. You know, it's going to be difficult in the tribulation to go to church. It's going to be, if it was a commandment, it's going to be near impossible to obey that commandment. So God gives them this liberty here. Just don't forsake the assembling of yourselves amongst each other. Try to get together. Try to have fellowship as much as you can. It's going to be rough, but you can't forsake that. That's the point here. And so for these pastors, these pastors, especially the Calvinists out there saying that God's commanded us to go to church, they're lying. He has not. They are simply twisting scripture to give themselves an excuse to do something that's not justified. And not only that, people, they're, they're members who are you know, feeling that, that fleshly itch to rebel and resist. They're going, yeah, God commanded us to go to church without realizing that in one simple move, they have now been put under the law, under a total legalistic system that will rob them of all joy. That is not what God intended for their lives. You are not, we are not under the law, but under grace. It was a total travesty. I mean, the... the Bold-faced lies to say what they said as to have an excuse to resist. And the people going along with it are getting put into a, a system of bondage that is just evil. Absolutely evil. Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> I could talk about that all day. Uh, Cliff says, angel messenger, purveyor of the word. Amen. I'm going to copy and paste that. Um, <laughs> Dan says, maybe Hal can fill in for you tomorrow. I'm taking tomorrow off. We're all taking tomorrow off. Cliff says, has, has Becky made room for you with the horses? Hey, that would be cool. <laughs> Um, that would be cool. Uh, one of the podcasts they talk about, a, they have a rather temperamental horse that had been abused. Um, yeah, I'm going to be in some, um, hotel with David Osteen, not in the same room, but in the same hotel and, uh, pray for David Osteen. He's going to need it. <laughs> I should play some jokes on him, don't you think? Um, uh, Dan says, Hal ain't doing nothing but smooching with Marilyn. Totally. Totally. And I have no problem um, telling him, get a room. <laughs> uh, Lion of Judah said, Osteen is excellent. I love that man. I love that man. Um, I, I am told that he says, uh, often in private, good night, nurse. I have no idea what that means. Hey, Persis is in the house. She says, you're making me jealous, and I'm not a weaker sister because I want to go to Brian and Dave's. Yeah, seriously, I love the subjects you bring up. Joel, you, Fred, and the guests are the best. Right. I'm surrounded by phenomenal people. That's for sure. Truly, truly phenomenal people. Um, I know... There are some people I'm going to look at uh, getting back on the podcast as a guest. Um, I will I will get back to that eventually, um, and we'll uh, have some more guests on here. I want to get that uh, that new guy on that we that I just learned about a couple few weeks ago. What was his name? Greg Willis. I'd like to get him on. I'm going to get Sam Gerhardt back on too. And try to reach out to a number of people. I just got a phone call from Russ Hargett. I don't know. I bet he's wanting to come on. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
Cliff says, establishing Bertucci dominance. I see someone ate all the Buckeyes. The Buckeyes are here. Oh, they're just hidden behind lights. They are right here. Those guys are amazing. Uh, it's Christ's work in their life. All glory to God. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, they've had many, many years of experience. And I've had uh, many, many hours of time to be able to uh, suck their brains dry. <laughs> and, um, you know, anybody can, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, spend time in the Word. You'll see, you'll see a difference in yourself. Persa says, come to Chicago suburbs. We have Lou Malnati's Great Pizza. Oh, I love Chicago pizza. I have uh, had made many, uh, a friend of mine and I had uh, real love for Chicago. We'd go up there at least once a year uh, for for a few years. And uh, I always went to Uno. Um, love that place downtown. And uh, I love the uh, corner bakery, too. I just, I don't know. It was just so good. Um, Chicago does have the best pizza, hands down. I totally agree. I am uh, very much uh, prefer the deep dish. <laughs> I totally agree. I'm, uh, all right. Persa says, same here, Dan, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, we don't have to wait until we die. It's resurrection power, I think. That's right. That's exactly right. That's a great point. I love that point. I love that point. That's a great point. And it's um. And I, one of the uh, um, one thought I had about the you know, one question I had was why is that power resting upon me rather than it him talking about a power from within that has sustained him and made him able to endure that suffering with joy? Why does he talk about a power upon him rather than a power from within? I really spent a lot of time reading a lot of different people to try to get an understanding of what that meant. And the uh, point a uh, few people made, when he talks about something be a, being upon him like that, it means it's a power that's visible to everybody around him. That's what he was, that's what he wanted. He wanted everybody around him to see the power that, that, that he was appropriating. They wanted, he wanted everybody around him to see the life of Christ that was already manifest in him. He wanted the visibility of that power to everyone else, which is the fact that, you know, in his, he was strong in his weakness by relying on Christ's resurrection power. Um, I love that point. That's a, that's a great point, Persis. I really, I really think that's great. Um... Dan says ROI is cashing in on people's fear for sure, right? Persa says uh, Gir Giordano's. Yep, I love Giordano's also. Uh, I'm, I, I just prefer eating it in the in the cities from where they came from. It's, it's you know there is a lot of Unos and Giordano's down here. Well, there were. I don't know if they were still around, but the um, Unos just it's not the same as when you eat it downtown in the original restaurant it just tastes different dan says really joel oh man am i really behind holy smokes uh cliff says uh, being close to hell must be like living to evade having ice cold water tossed on your latest imagination nothing ambiguous right right totally <laughs> Got a lot of reallys going on around there. That's hilarious. Persa says, "Well, seriously, uh, this uh, person uh, we were we've been talking about fell off the rails." Yes, he did. Totally. We need to keep praying for him. It is heresy. He is on my prayer list, and I do mention him often. Huh. When, <laughs> uh, no, Cliff. One day, Hal and I are going to be fishing. And we'll be swapping stories about Cliff Matthews. Um, 
Brother Rick said no fishing in heaven. That's not true. We don't know that. Um, there is, uh, you know, there are fields of flax. There's, uh, you know, they make manna in heaven. Um, there's, uh, I think there might be corn too. Um, there just might be fishing in heaven. I wouldn't put it, I, I wouldn't say no to that. You can't show me a Bible verse that proves there wouldn't be. Uh, uh, Bob says ROI has gotten out of the box and created an entirely new box. The box of confusion. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody had a hilarious exchange with ROI that had me rolling. A certain, uh, a certain hilarious Massachusetts uh, pre grace preacher. Uh, it's probably the funniest thing uh, out there. Um, we have our license to fish with Christ. I sure wish I had uh, someone real like Hal to splash me back to reality some days. Uh, that's what he does. <laughs> that's what he does. That's for sure. That is him, without a doubt. You get drifting off in the la la land, he will get in your face and tell you what's wrong. <laughs> Uh, and he pulls no punches either. So, it's all good. It's all good. And let me see here. Dan says, just get saved to have liberty. Amen. Bob Picard says, crying kids and earthquakes don't distract me, but the wonderful smell of food. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Gerard says, Nicolaitans does remind me of ex cathedra, depending upon others how to interpret the Holy Bible. All right. Uh, Bob says, kitchen fishing is wonderful, especially when there are fish and rolls in the oven. <laughs> Dan says, we groaneth in Christ. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Sandra says, God's grace is sufficient. You must believe this, saints. Absolutely. Messenger of Satan, right. Uh, George says, uh, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, right. Cliff says, I think Ford owners are long-suffering. <laughs> Church says, I have a good analogy of how you can take pleasure in infirmities and what it does and doesn't mean, but it is a lot to type. Uh, it was sufficient for Paul and it's sufficient for us. Cliff, they are, aren't they? Suffering, uh, Church says, uh, suffering with a joyous and peaceful attitude is one of the most powerful ways to show the power of Christ and the peace of grace and God on this earth and you'll be rewarded eternally for it. Doesn't mean you have to enjoy being in pain, but you can enjoy the opportunities that will present to you to show the power and glory of our Creator. Totally. Love what you did. You totally get it. It's one of the greatest tools witnessed to others we can ever have. Yeah, uh, and I would just say that goes back to a, a thought that I, uh, we often expressed on a podcast and then on podcasts and uh, in that, during that suffering series was just the fact that there is no more powerful a testimony than the suffering servant. And it's not just the fact that the servant is suffering, but it is how he is handling that suffering. What's his attitude like? Uh, how much joy is he exhibiting while he suffers? Um, there is nothing more powerful than that. And so sometimes when you think of uh, problems you're going through and stuff, the manner in which you handle those problems and react to those circumstances is, uh, is you know, you're looking at perhaps some of the most powerful testimonies you'll ever have in your life while you're going through hard times. Um, <laughs> Gerard says, one of the reasons I've never driven a Ford, accustomed to Mercedes, Benz, and Audi, so never a Ford. 
Well, that must be nice. Um, Sandra says, it's been a really good uh, morning. See you soon. Love you, Sandra. You take good care. Persis says, for 34 years, oh, I've had significant pain for 34 years. And a titanium spine, shoulder, hip, and hand to prove it. When my body goes up, the unsaved can dig me up and make a penny or two, right? <laughs> Cliff says, Ford, far out rust design. <laughs> totally, totally. Uh, drives quick march, Thunderbirds are a go, that's right, man. Justin says, was studying Romans 6 all last night. I'm dead and crucified with Christ, freed from sin, risen with him, free from the law. Yeah, it's, it's, it, that cha chapter doesn't suck, does it? <laughs> that chapter is just awesome. And um, you meditate on that, too. You, you know, now that you, you know, I mean, when, even, even with me, I still meditate on identification because of the reality of what it means for me today being dead, buried, and risen with Christ. Uh, there's more than just that. You know, uh, the manifestation of his uh, resurrection life in us. Okay, so we're living his resurrection life. What, is that, what does that mean exactly? How do I appropriate that life? How do I live that life to the fullest? All that stuff. You could meditate on that forever. Persis says, love the Old Testament. Exactly. Love how it shows us the character of the Godhead. I couldn't agree more. Uh, from the wretched radio guy, he often talks with James White and John MacArthur, right? I follow him on YouTube just to uh, get ideas for things to talk about, maybe. Um, you know, take, take the topic, whatever he's talking about, and then give the proper sound doctrinal response to it. <laughs> um, I'll never forget when he uh, got sick during the lockdown and he got the, and he got the, and he got the, the uh, uh, coof and, uh, and then he finally came back on Wretched Radio and just agonized over what was it that he did wrong that caused God to make him want him to have the virus agonized over what the problem was what did i do wrong why did he why did he punish me like this there's got to be a reason and then he kind of went down this path where he just well it must be my attitude toward these people over here i suspect i have a bad attitude there and so i need to fix that and adjust that and kind of thing how would <laughs> that's just total balderdash that's complete vain imagination of the mind and the heart it's complete lunacy how would <laughs> How would you presume to know? I mean, first of all, you're, you're, we're, you've already, the Christ has already paid the penalty for all your sins. You have in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, Paul telling us that he is not imputing our trespasses unto us. He, basically, he's not charging people for their sins. Why would he, and, and, you know, after we get saved and his righteousness is imputed to us, all of our sins have been paid for by the cross. Why would God suddenly punish us for something uh, about something for which he had already punished his son on the cross? That makes no sense. Um, yeah, we've been delivered from the wrath to come. For us, it's a, a positive reinforcement, grace-based victory program. You know, he is... He has paid for all your sins. You live a life of gratitude for what was already done for you. And as an added bonus, he's going to give you rewards at the Bema Seat for the quality of your service. Why wouldn't you want to serve him? Why wouldn't you want to um, uh, 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 you know, completely renew your mind, transform your life, and be a living thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't you want to do that when he, this is what he gave you? So, you know... It's so irritating that <laughs> this guy, he thinks this whole coronavirus was commissioned by God. God foreordained that this virus be sent out into the world before he even uh, made it. And he picked and chose who it is that's going to get this virus and who doesn't. And everybody, he's, everybody that's gotten this virus is, 
is under the judgment of God. He is chastening them for some reason. Complete and total lies. It is the, that's the kind of lies and heresy that comes out of a completely, totally evil system like Calvinism. Just total bunk. All of it. Don't get me started. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Church says also none should know better than a grace believer that a man that a man's wrong actions are not disproof of their beliefs. Totally, totally. You know, you're either looking at a choice to fulfill the lust of the flesh, or you're just ignorant. Um, sorry. Karen said Ricky's article concludes learning uh, not to speak evil of uh, the often evil power of civil leaders in an unfathomably difficult path to tread at times for some, but it is the path trodden by the apostle. Great point. Great point. Uh, apostle Paul and his Christ, and it is my earnest plea that it is the path you will choose as well. Great point. Thank you very much for that. That's, that is a superb point. Um, um, here's a really tough question. You know, um, and not not just okay. So, what does it mean to speak evil? Uh, you could, you can. Is it, you know, um, that in and of itself is a great study. Uh, the uh, you don't speak falsely of somebody. You know, it's not. Um, I mean, uh, you don't just sit there and ridicule, lampoon. Uh, um, well, I don't want to say. Um. My mind's drawing a blank on that. Um, but when it comes to speaking evil, you know, especially when it comes to political leaders, was what is what are what are we saying about our political leaders and those with whom we disagree? Do we do you still pray for that leader? We're to be praying for kings, all men especially those in authority. Are you praying for our president? There's a tough question. Um, and uh, what, is, what, is the, what is the tone and, what is, and how is it that you speak of those in authority? That's a great point. Love that. Um, I'll pray for those even with whom I disagree. Um, Gerard, um, do you know the Greek part of the scriptures does contain 27 books because in ancient times the Greek alphabet had 27 characters? I have no idea. Church says, do you think Jesus' interference in the stoning of the woman was partly Rome and made it illegal for the Jews to perform executions or was it simply because of mob justice uh, versus due process? They brought that woman, you're talking about the time he wrote in the sand, one of my favorite stories. They brought that woman to him because he didn't, he, nobody ever died in his presence. And in fact, he brought people back to life and he healed people. Um, and uh, so they wanted to put him into a bind to try to get him to um, justify killing. Nobody died in his presence ever during his three, three and a half years. During his three years. Um, and, uh, so yeah, they wanted to, so that, so how do you, what do you do when you don't want anybody to die in your presence? Uh, and you have, uh, they bring to you a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and, uh, according to the law with all the witnesses, she deserved to die. Well, really you could have allowed for justice and then brought her back to life. I mean, that would, <laughs> you know, could have resurrected her afterwards, but Jesus was far more brilliant than that. He started writing in the sand, and all the guys took off. <laughs> now, some have said that he was writing some Bible verse in the sand or Bible reference or something. <clears throat> I go with the traditional view that he was writing names of their, the witnesses were all having affairs. They all had mistresses, and he was writing their names in the sand, and that's why they took off, because they were all guilty of the same things she was guilty of. 
And uh, I just love that story. Uh, but uh, Persia says, Church, don't you think he was pointing out the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders? When I was in, um, Dan says, when I was in RCC grade school, the nuns tried to put this crap on me by asking us if the government required you to kill your parents, what would you do? Well, exactly. Exactly. And there are many cases, I don't know of any cases yet, where, uh, where civil disobedience is merited in the United States. Although the government has in the past been very difficult, um, and especially in the olden days. I mean, they had... Um, you had uh, state... Uh, state-approved um, religions at times, and they har harassed and persecuted others rather terribly at times. Um, but, you know, one thing that we are to do is to resist evil in all forms. Um, Church says no, because I think it was a judicial process to stone people as punishment, but there was exactly that a uh, process. Yeah, he was he was a giver. He was supposed to be a giver of life. He was a, he was um, part of the prophecies was that he would bring life, not take life. Nobody was ever supposed to die in his presence. Justin said, uh, Proverbs twenty one thirty: There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. Right. Justin said, what a terrible question to pose to a young child, right? Totally. Justin said, uh, Dan says, I told them I would say, okay, give me the gun. I knew that the persecution wouldn't end and I could give them a quick death. Wow. <laughs> Karen says, normal is not coming back, but Jesus is. That's right. That's right. Uh, Persia says, Gerard, no, I didn't know that. Um... I haven't studied the Greek since my 20s and can't recall it at all. Uh, I'm a uh, King James gal and take God at his word in English. I've uh, even stopped um, uh, fussing with Strong's Concordance. Church says, are you in resistance to the abortions happening across America? Go down there and try and turn the people away. Write to your senators. Um... Justin says, wonderful to hear that Persis right there with you with the pure text we have in English. Yep. Um, all just satanic distractions to keep up, keep us from the truth. Amy Stewart says, we must go to church. Balderdash. <laughs> Be the church, she says. I loved it. I love that. Excellent. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, church says no one is going to guilt me and tell me what to do other than God's word. Totally. Is it possible there will be times when, you know, I mean, there are places, that, oh, you consider the fact that, you know, in China, all the stuff going on in China, um, you can't share the gospel with anybody. The pastors in China are being told what to say behind the pulpit would i commit civil disobedience you betcha you betcha and um would i uh, still also uh but i wouldn't lie to the government about my civil disobedience either i'd speak truth to power and submit myself to the punishment uh, north korea is unbelievably awful you're not allowed to own a bible you're not allowed to you're not allowed to have any kind of religious affiliation would I be committing civil disobedience there? You betcha. Without a doubt. Um, you have in places like, what is it, Pakistan, India, where they have anti-conversion laws where you can't, you know, if, if you persuade someone to change their faith and convert to Christianity, uh, more often than not, you're going to be accused of coercion, and they are going to throw you in prison. Does that mean that you stop giving the gospel? Nope. Going to continue to give the gospel, no matter what. Um, you know, you think of Afghanistan or Nigeria, 
where you've got intense persecution of the Christians, does that mean that you hide your faith? No, you go out there and give the gospel. In the face of death, you give the gospel, and you do it in love. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons I would do civil disobedience. Um, Russia has a weird thing where you're only allowed to talk about spiritual matters within the confines of your church building. You cannot discuss it outside of church. That's what it's like in Russia. Um, I might consider that I might do some civil disobedience there if that was the case. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, you know, how are you going to get people into church if you can't talk about it when you're outside of church, you know? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one long and hard. That, that, that would be difficult. Um, uh, China, I don't think you're allowed to have a Bible. God tells you to study to show yourself approved unto God. Get a Bible. And I would be out there being part of the uh, problem of uh, delivering Bibles, without a doubt. Um, I wouldn't have a problem doing all kinds of civil disobedience in China. Uh, there was, uh, I do enjoy articles about Pangbo. I look him up every once in a while on Bitter Winter. Peng Bo was uh, in charge of all the persecution of Christians and uh, the evil cults out there in China. And he was uh, supposed to persecute them online. And then all of a sudden, a couple of months ago, the Chinese Communist Party arrested him. And then they actually, they don't usually do this, but with him, they put out a, uh, a statement declaring a long laundry list, extremely long laundry list of all these uh, issues of corruption uh, with him and how terrible he is and um, I remember Bitter Winter was thinking that you know what happened here and this happens a few times a man gets into that position in which he is supposed to be the one who is the tip of the spear persecuting the Christians and everybody and all these illegal cults in China the so called and, uh, and then he begins to investigate what it is that they believe and then he becomes a believer himself Peng Bo is uh, sitting in, chi in a Chinese jail right now, and all a 10 to 1, he became a believer in that position. And they were really angry at him that he was, uh, uh, shall we say, ineffective with his, some of his persecution. He wasn't, be he wasn't mo becoming more aggressive. He was becoming less, less. And um, so I find that story interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm all about uh, civil disobedience when it comes to matters that are very plainly uh, forcing you to betray your faith. I've not seen anything like that here. Um, I don't. I, maybe uh, there's something I'm I'm not thinking of. But um, in any event, uh, when it comes to the um, the mandates, my my views. I've mentioned my views thousand times so I, don't, I won't burden you with that um, all right let me see here Gerard says uh, uh, thank you for that church uh, balderdash pastors passing around the guilt driven system that's right uh, Gerard says just as the Hebrew Tanakh is containing 22 books corresponding with 22 characters of the Hebrew alphabet, dividing in 39 sections, 22 Hebrew books plus 27 Greek books. <laughs> um, all right, I should probably close it down here. Let me, let me uh, skim through some of these last few comments, and then I'll give the gospel here. I've just got 17 people with me. Um, how ironic that RCC spends their time opposing abortion while they are going to uh, the lake of fire. That's right. Uh, good night, nurse. Used to indicate or comment on a disastrous conclusion. Oh, also used to indicate surprise or exasperation. Oh, well, thank you very much for that. Earl Carter. How you doing, brother? Good to see you. <laughs> you are another who is so red that you're turning blue. That's right. Some days I feel it, man. Uh, you're not too shabby yourself. I love a lot of your comments, dude. Actually, I don't know of any comment I didn't love. 
A uh, person says, I loved hearing Sam preach. Sam's beautiful. He wants to come back on. We never did get around to talking about uh, how he came into grace. Uh, Oral says, purged in the word and prayer is helping my faith grow. Outside of that is mental rage, frustration. Um, um, well, that's something you can work on. You know, we started the um, podcast looking at Philippians 4. Where is your mind? What are you thinking about? Are you getting caught up with the things of this earth? Or are you, are you setting your affection and you're setting your mind on things above? Where's your mind? You can control where your mind is. You can control how, you can actually control your emotions and how you're, what you're thinking and feeling because where is your mind? Um, uh, that's, um, that's an important part. And you know, all of the stuff going on in the world. That, that is all temporary. How much time do we have left? How much time do you think that it'll be before the Lord comes back? Dude, you know, make sure the foundation of your life is pure joy and knowing who you are in Christ. And you got to put on, put off all those attributes of anger and all that stuff. And put on the attributes of Christ. Because all this stuff and politics and civil liberties and mandates and very, all of it's temporary. You know, we got to be focused on eternal things. Having an eternal spiritual perception about everything. And make sure that one of the things that will keep you from being frustrated is to just keep your mind focused on the big picture of it all. Which is, you know, the... Uh, the long suffering that has an end game to it, which is salvation, which was why we have to do the work of an evangelist if we're in these last days of grace. And this is also the big picture is is not what ha happens to us here and who does what and who doesn't. But what it, the big picture is the eternal rewards, us serving the Lord, doing the work of the Lord, doing the work of an evangelist, because those will ha things have eternal consequences. Um, so I'll just throw, I just suggest that. Man, I hope you're good. It's good to see you. Person says, uh, Uno was the best. I missed that. Yep, they were. Oh, man, Uno's phenomenal. I never missed Uno in Chicago. Um... Earl says, it still troubles me that I still have moments of mental rage, anger, but God knows, and I suppose that I will, that will fade as I grow in Christ further. Um, I had those problems uh, when I came back to the Lord, and what I did was quote verses to myself. I said, Joel, stop it. And I, uh, the verse I quoted the most was Ephesians 4.32, you know, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you and that verse to me was not it was a humbling verse reminding me that god has had to forgive me which is why i need to be forgiving of other people because you are no better than everybody anybody else in fact you're probably worse in some ways humility gets rid of that anger real quick for me it did um being humbly reminded of my own failings which is why i had no excuse to be angry at others um, but I do still have occasionally have issues. Um, it's not completely gone. Amy Stewart says maybe Sasquatch will be in heaven. <laughs> um, uh, Amy Stewart had an awesome photo of herself and her hubby with Sasquatch, and I laughed my head off. It was awesome. <laughs> Persia says there are horses in heaven. My friends have been, agree with you. I love me some fishing. Well, I bet you don't ever have to worry about not catching anything up in heaven if there is fishing. Be strong in the Lord. Get a hold of that word. Strong. That's right. Now, when he says that in Ephesians, being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, what does it mean to be strong in the Lord? Did you do you notice there that he doesn't say he doesn't beg the Lord for strength. He doesn't, being, he doesn't talk about being strong from the Lord. Being strong by the Lord. No, he says to be strong in 
the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Well, what does that mean? Well, that is to find strength. It means that that strength is already there, that you already have that strength. That strength is already yours. It is appropriating strength that's already available to you. It is being strong in what God has made you in His Son. Being strong in, in, the, in, in, in being that new creature that you are, you know, is being strong having reckoned who you are in Christ and then living your life according to those truths and being strong in that. Being strong in, in the fact that you know you're freed from sin and you, that's, a, that's a strength to you. I love that. Uh, I'm getting tired. I'm going to have to wind it down here. This is just, you guys have just been absolutely phenomenal. You guys have truly been great. Um, Cliff says, Maker of heaven, awesome Lord, a Lord, Lord of all, O oh, most holy, on my knees I fall. I love that. Church says, Serving from thankfulness for the Master who paid my slave debt and shows me nothing but grace and promise. Amen. Uh, video fan says, uh, Oral says, didn't God use sickness, etc. in the Old Testament as judgment, correction? Not saying he's using COVID. I think we're responsible for what uh, much of what happens. I agree. Now, I know there's different views as to where and how it originated, and I'm not e even going to get into that. The point is, it doesn't make any difference. We're living in a sin-cursed world. Our reaction is still the same, regardless of where it came from and how it, how it got here. Um, Persis says, uh, who is this wretched radio guy? Uh, Todd Friel, F-R-I-E-L. Todd Friel. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I almost disagree with him on every video. Uh, <laughs> I just find interesting what it is that he's talking about, not what his, uh, <laughs> perception is about it <coughs> all right let me see here <coughs> Amy Stewart says is it okay uh, to pray for uh Shall we say a certain leader to be removed from office? That is, there is a verse on that in uh, Proverbs, in there. <laughs> there is a verse about that in the scriptures. I used to quote that all the time during the, uh, well, during certain presidents. <laughs> and, uh, but that was, you know, of course the basis of that verse was that the Lord would remove that particular king that uh, <clears throat> they uh, did not like. And God sometimes did. Um, let me see here. <laughs> I think it's okay to tell the Lord anything that you want, to tell the Father anything you want. You hope to see, gosh, I really hope so-and-so gets better. I hope this uh, particular individual is no longer leading us. I hope this country comes back, you know, comes back around to uh, uh, maybe we could have a big grace uh, uh, um, a revival of the grace message in the United States that the whole country would just totally fall in love with the grace message. <laughs> I, you can tell God anything you want, you know, as long as you keep in the uh, proper perspective what it is that he may or may not do about it. <laughs> um, uh, Oral says at 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Right. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. How does that how does that happen? <coughs> Excuse me. How does that happen? How does that happen? Number uh, First Corinthians eleven. Oh, you know, there's there's a lot there's a lot going on in that chapter. But how does that happen? The chastening when you're judged. If we judge ourselves, uh, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Does that mean God's changing circumstances and giving you uh, a COVID because of 
you know, he's judging you. Is that what that's saying? Context tells you exactly what it is. It, the context of that verse, you know, uh, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. You know, he ain't chastening you through circumstances. That's the point. Dan says, pray always, but we should not be sidetracked by this world. Totally. Cliff says, uh, probably, hon, Jesus wrote girlfriend's names. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I've had a lot of pastors tell me different theories about what it is that he wrote. Probably Bible verse, probably this and that. I always, <clears throat> I'm going to go with a theory that he wrote the names of the mistresses of the accusers. That always gets a laugh. I love that. And I, I, it's, I have loved that story since I was a child. That was always my understanding, and I'm just sticking with it just because. It may not be true, but we don't really know what it is he wrote anyway. So why not uh, presuppose that he uh, <coughs> uh, wrote their names? Uh, I know somebody's got a Bible verse from the Old Testament about prophesying about the Lord writing uh, writing in the sand or something. I know something like that exists in the Old Testament. Somebody will point it out to me somewhere, but you know what? I'm still sticking with the mistresses. <laughs> Church says, uh, Oral, uh, I don't know if... Uh, being, no, he's being sincere. Uh, Amy Stewart says, um, well, everybody's saying the same thing I'm saying, so I'm going to skip over that. Persis says... Um, Uh, let me see here. Uh, he points out six, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 9 is unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As chastened and not killed. Right. I did a whole message on that, brother. Uh, Persis says, uh, notice the offering men weren't brought with the same woman. Um, oh, notice the offending men uh, weren't brought with a woman. I have, I, I have noticed that too and it always bugged me. Always bugged me. And, you know, in the Old Testament, I went through Leviticus um, a couple months ago. That was <coughs> tedious. <laughs> and, they, and, and, you know, the man and the woman both should be uh, stoned for that act. They both deserve to die, not just the woman. Maybe he somehow got away. Persis says, notice the, uh, uh, um, the giver of life reminds us of an old archer's song. The giver of life is still given. Too bad they were charismatics from Cali. <laughs> you don't got to go to church. You get to. Love that, Bob. Uh, being thrown in prison for your beliefs. What an amazing opportunity to witness to the guards and the prisoners. Right. And amazing. And you remember, too, that when you're. When, even when you're sick, or when you, even the weird things that happen in your life, you know, the suffering servant, your attitude when you go through that suffering uh, is the most powerful testimony you can have. Uh, and I just, I just point to Chris Nelson for that. Chris, uh, phenomenal attitude, and he has daily back pain like you wouldn't believe. Um, all right, let me, let me kind of shut it down here. Let me. Uh, Church says, I think the Lord will come back precisely when he means to. That's right. Uh, great point, R.E. China. Thank you very much, Persis. Um, Church says, God forgave us for all things, so we should forgive people for only some things. Know all things always. Amen. Amen. Uh, Justin says, yeah, talking to mom on the phone, it gets my anger going at times. <laughs> um... Yeah, I can under, I can sympathize. I, I've never had that issue with my mom. She's not crazy like that. But uh, yeah, I've known some moms. I can understand that feeling. Would be annoying. Um, hatred of a brother is just a lack of forgiveness. That's exactly it. Lack of forgiveness, lack of grace, lack of love. Lack of long-suffering. Uh, totally. Um... All right. I needed to hear this, Joel, strong in the Lord. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that a great point? It's not my own. I didn't come up with that point. I, you know, that's just something I learned. No, it's not. But I always love that point. What is it? Being strong in the Lord. That strength is already there. It's, you already have it. it it's, it's being strong in who you are in Christ. Yeah, isn't that great? It's not, because people are like praying that, you know, God, give me strength. Give me this. Give me that. And Paul's sitting there telling you in that verse, you know, you're already strong. Be strong. 
You know, you've already got it. You already got that strength. Now use it. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, let me see here. Lots of coughing. Joel, time to give up the stogies. <laughs> I'll give it up when I start dating. If I start, if I date somebody, you know, I'll be willing to give it up then. Give me something soft to press my lips up against if I ever get that chance. But uh, until then, no, because I have my most brilliant thoughts when I'm having a stogie. <laughs> um, choking on cold pizzas, he took his last breath and returned to the Lord. That would be awesome. I could just die right on a live stream. I, that would be great. Uh, don't bring any sicky germs up north. I'm not bringing my stogies up north with me either. I'm going to um, just totally enjoy my time with everybody. Uh, church says, let every prayer and request be known, but pray for his will to be done and yours and with a thankful heart. Totally agree. Uh, Persa says, beautiful verses, Joel. I have a story about that uh, forgiveness. It's uh, hard on our hearts when we're face to face, when we realize we haven't forgiven someone. I think it happens once. Right. 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 I, do, I love that thought. Yep. Um, Here's what I think I need, Lord, or what I think I want, but you know best, your will be done, and thank you for it. You remember, church, the, um, there's that verse 2 where Paul talks about lifting up holy hands. Where is that? Somewhere in the pastoral epistles, uh, I think. I can't remember. Holy hands. 1 Timothy 2.8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Does that mean we're supposed to literally lift our hands up every time we pray? Everywhere we are? What if you pray in the car? Are you going to lift up your holy hands? <laughs> I think it's a figure of speech that, uh, you know, when you pray, you're lifting up your holy hands. In the sense, you're offering your hands. You're offering yourself as service to God, as a potential answer to that prayer, to what you're talking to God about. You're offering yourself as the solution to whatever it is you're talking about. I love that expression, lifting up holy hands. And I love, um, I love that idea, you're lifting up your holy hands. You're offering yourself in service to God to help with whatever that situation is you're praying about. I love that thought. Um... Uh, what else we got here? <laughs> I love Randy. I need to follow up with him about my book. Uh, and I need to, uh, I also need to work on uh, another book. I love you guys. Let me, uh, uh, if you're out there and you hadn't figured it out yet, if you've been out there and you're new and you're listening and you've never, you don't know if you've got eternal life and, uh, and you hadn't figured out yet in all, of, in all of our conversations what it takes to uh, get to heaven when you die. I mean, how is it you avoid that lake of fire? How is it that you can actually know you, ha you are saved and you are going to be with God when you die? How do you know that? Well, Apostle Paul has a little thing he calls the gospel of the grace of God. He talks about the free gift of eternal life. Free gift of eternal life. This is something that God the Father is offering you for free. All you got to do is believe. All you got to do is believe that Christ died on that cross, was buried, rose again as a complete payment for all your sins. And, the, uh, and if you just simply believe that, trust in that, then you can get the free gift of eternal life. That's it. You're saved. Not only are you saved, but you're eternally secure. Accepted in the beloved. Blessed with all spiritual blessings. You'll become a new creature, and you will be sealed by that spirit unto the day of redemption. The day that you die, or the day you get raptured out of here with the rest of us. So if you're out there and you're not sure, I beg you to believe. Believe with all of your, believe with your heart and your mind. Believe that Christ died for you and rose again the third day and that he paid for all your sins. If you believe that and trust in that, you shall be saved. Uh, Amy Stewart says, uh, no one likes stogie breath. I totally agree. That's why I brush my teeth. And we also have um, mouthwash stuff we use a lot. All right, guys, love you dearly. Are you saying, take me, Father, and lift me up? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm saying that too. All right, I love you guys dearly. Thank you so very much for coming out here today. A uh, quick prayer here, and then we're going we're gonna to set it down. Heavenly Father, how much we love you. How much we love all the saints in the live chat, all of the members of the uh, church, the subscribers to the channel. We lift all, every last one of them up in all their circumstances. And I pray that we will all have mighty testimonies and we will all have the, when we suffer, we will all have a phenomenal testimony, the suffering servant, and that it, the, your, the power of your son will be visible to everyone around all of us. And I pray that as we go into these, what may be hard times, we may stay focused on things above, with our affection on things above. And uh, Father, I just pray that we will be able to put on and model and, and exhibit every single attribute of your son. Father, I love you. We love you. We are so grateful for everything. I can't even put into words all every aspect of everything you've done for us, I'm so grateful for. Especially this church and these saints that I get the chance to interact with. I love you, Father. We love you very much, and we are so grateful for everything. I pray that we will all abound in hope, abound in love and grace toward one another, supporting each other, and that everything we say and do will be to the glory and honor of your Son, our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, if you didn't, um, if you're not already sick of me, there's going to be another session tonight at seven o'clock. I'm going to talk about the angel of the Lord. So come on back. Should be, it's going to be good. It's a really good sermon. It's uh, lots of new stuff that's just weird. It's weird some of this stuff. But the angel of the Lord, can you figure it out? He is elusive, enig enigmatic, mysterious. Uh, so come on back. We'll have a great big uh, dis dis uh, dissection of that whole topic. Um, I love you guys dearly. You take great care. Have a truly bad day. And we'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock. Thanks so much, guys.